Hello and welcome to our second edition of Crowdfunding for Artists. Uh, this week we're going to be talking specifically about crowdfunding for visual artists. Uh, but please do bear in mind that if you're any other type of artist or actually any other type of crowdfunding project at all, there'll still be tons of really relevant and useful information in here. It's just that the um, uh, specific examples and some of the things we'll be talking through will be um, specifically crafted for visual artists today. Um, so I'm also doing an Instagram takeover today um, on the Crowdfunder Instagram account. So if you don't follow us already, please do have a look on there and join us and see what I'm up to around the office today. Day. Some of you may have seen my fantastic attempt at doing some art uh, in, in 30 seconds <laughs> I just posted up a minute ago. Um, so please do join us on there as well. So what I'm going to do now is actually go over onto a presentation that's just going to guide us um, through this as we go through today. So First of all, a little bit of an introduction to us here at Crowdfunder. So we're based um, down here in Newquay. I've got a lovely view of the sea, of the surf, out of the window um, in front of me, and lots of activity going on in the office behind there. So we're a rewards-based crowdfunding platform. We're the biggest uh, rewards-based crowdfunding platform in the UK. Um, you may have heard of some of the other types of crowdfunding. Uh, you may have heard of things like equity with companies like Crowdcube, whereby you can offer up a percentage of your business in, in return for money and, and then those people own a share in your business. You may have heard of lending as well, uh, companies like Cedars for example, whereby you actually borrow that money from lots of people instead of borrowing from a bank, for example. Um, but you do have to pay that back. Community shares works very similar to equity, but is specifically for community groups, community assets. And then, of course, we've got things like donation, um, sites where um, people do a lot of charity um, fundraising, but it, it's essentially just a, a one way. You give the money, you don't necessarily get anything back. So we sit there um, on rewards. As I say, the, the main way in which it differs is that you're not giving away any um, any shares in your company. You don't have to pay the money back. All that you're agreeing to is a really simple exchange, a one-off exchange. And that's that money that they're pledging towards your target in return for that one-off reward, that thing that they're receiving in return, that means that they're getting something of value back for that contribution. Now, here we have a bit of an example just to explain um, exactly how rewards crowdfunding works. So you see there we have Phil, Phil from Leeds Bread Co-op. Now, he wanted to open this bakery um, up in Leeds. He needed around about £8,000 to buy all the equipment, the ovens, to get it all kitted out. Now, he gone to the banks, wasn't able to borrow any money uh, for the business. He didn't have any inheritance or, or, or savings that he could sort of rely on um, to, to buy that specific part of, of what he needed to get things off the ground. So he decided to crowdfund. Um, he actually raised £1,000 um, from 144 different people in his local community. And the kind of things that they were getting in return was things like uh, you know, a loaf of bread every week for a year, or you know, a specially designed birthday cake, or, or for a, a celebration cake for a different occasion. And of course, what Phil got was he got the money that he needed. He was then able to buy that equipment to install those ovens and to get his business off the ground. So that's just a, one really simple way of explaining how rewards crowdfunding works. So why do people bother to crowdfund? And I think this is a, is a really key one. Obviously, the funding, that's the obvious bit. It's in the name, so we know that. Um, but for a lot, of, a lot of people, the other aspects that come with it are actually just as important, if not more important sometimes. Validation is really key for projects like Phil's with him opening a bakery. Now, how does he know that actually people eat bread, that they want to buy bread, that they're interested in the kind of things that he wanted to do with his business. Really good way of actually just testing, is this a good idea, is there an appetite for this, is to crowdfund. If people want it, if people support it, they'll, they'll, they'll fund it, they'll put their money towards it. It's a really, really great way of, of dipping a toe, testing that water with relatively low risk. 
Now, marketing and, and actually converting advocates are, are two that kind of go hand in hand. Now, as you go through the process of crowdfunding, in its very essence, it, it, you know, in, in what makes it what it is, you'll be shouting from the rooftops about your idea, about your business, about your project, whatever that might be. Because of that, it means that that awareness locally and, and maybe in, in that particular industry or even sort of further field and, and, and you know, globally and worldwide is just going to be that much higher. People will have heard of you. And that's really, really key you know, for, for any project is to make sure that people um, are aware of what you're doing, of your benefits. There's a recognition of, of you know, that there's something good happening here, that there's something perhaps that they could get involved with or something that they might want to purchase or a way in which they can see the value to their community um, in what it is that you're doing. And of course, turning existing customers or existing supporters into advocates. Crowdfunding is one of the very best ways of actually doing that, of giving those people who are already in your world something to rally around, something to really get them excited and to cement and concrete that support into actually getting them um, working for you and, and making sure that they're spreading the word too and, and getting the word out there about what it is you're doing, what you're trying to do. Um, and why that's something that's interesting, worthwhile or, or exciting. So today, obviously, we're talking specifically about artists. So this all stems from the fact we're just um, launching at the moment a new campaign focusing on art artists, supporting individual artists. Um, that might be anyone, you know, as I say, from literature through to dance, music, um, digital art, theatre. Um, all the different kind of um, realms that, that you may um, fall into if you are an individual artist. And we have £125,000 worth of funding to go towards artists who are crowdfunding on Crowdfunder. But I'm going to come on to how that funding works in a little bit more detail later on. So for now, what we're going to do is break down the stages of, of getting your crowdfunding project from from that very conception stage right to being fully funded. We're going to break that down into three uh, main steps. So step one is planning your project. Now, first part, of course, is to build your team. What we mean by that is for you to figure out who is going to help me to get this off the ground. Who is going to help me to promote it? Who's going to help me to create it? Who's going to help me to shoot a video? to speak to people locally, who's got a good eye for design, who can perhaps make my page look nice, who's maybe very good at writing, who can edit some of the wording that I might want to put on my page. What skills you have. Have a look at what skills perhaps you could do with um, sourcing in. Do you actually um, need someone who can help out with Instagram, for example, because you're not super familiar with it, but you know someone who is? Do you need someone who can help you to edit, edit a video because it's not something you've really done before and you'd really benefit from their expertise? And start those conversations early. Start to figure out who it is um, that can help you out with this. Worth me mentioning at this point that you can download a crowdfunding for artists pack straight from that artist page, which is crowdfunder.co.uk forward slash artists. If you go onto there, you can download this pack. Now, it's, it's quite long, it's around about 30 pages, but don't be put off. Um, it's designed as, as a bit of an accompaniment to this session. So you can use that to work through and, and to actually go through some of the activities that I'm talking about here. So next from building your team, you know, really, really key, but probably the most key thing that you'll do here is identifying your crowd. That's figuring out who it is that is going to support your project. Now, it sounds, you know, almost like a, a sort of obvious um, kind of thing to do. But what we want to do is think very, very broadly, but also think very, very specifically. Now, the top answer that I hear when I say who's going to back your project is anyone. And actually, that's not good enough. We need to be more specific than that. Anyone and everyone is, is way too broad, way, way, way too broad. We need to figure out where do these people live? What are they interested in? How old are they? Are they male? Are they female? What else are they doing with their spare time? Do they have kids? Do they not? All, all of these things that helps you to characterize exactly who it is 
um, that we're going out to. And of course, there's, a, there's an element of growing that crowd as well, of making sure that we are exploring every avenue and every channel of communication and making sure that any areas we think we may be able to tap into, we've nurtured that as much as possible in the planning stage. So just to, to show you a bit of an example of how to do that mapping out of who is in your network, who's your possible backers, I definitely start with this. Obviously, do, do your own um, version. I believe this is roundabout on page nine of that crowdfunding for artists fundraising pack. So definitely use this to get you started. But it may be that actually you have lots of other pockets of people that you can put on there that we haven't included. So, for example, you might want to put on here um, key individuals that you think are good gatekeepers who can help you to access other groups of people. Um, you might want to highlight them in, you know, in a particular colour and sort of remember um, that there's one really important that you need to go out to. It may be that actually an organisation or, or a, um, a group, someone who meets, you know, a group of people who meet every week, actually would, would be a really, really key group for you to go out to. It might be that actually, you know, someone who's, who's more of a sort of a, a registered, a, a formal organisation, like a school or an artist hub or a university locally, might again be a really good source of pledges for you. So really think about your own situation and think about all the different people that you might be able to reach and really do just put pen to paper. You might think, I know all this in my head, but actually having it written down is really useful. So I'm just going to give you a second just to have a look at that. Okay, so here we have a little bit of an example, a bit of a case study of a project I worked with in May this year, actually. Um, obviously, you know, an artist in their own right, they're actually filmmakers. Um, but what we're going to do is have a look at how they did it in the, in the warm-up stage. Obviously, we can see um, where they ended up, actually, which was raising over £10,000. Um, but let's have a look at how they got there. So this is what I was talking about in terms of growing your crowd. At the point at which your project goes live, you should really have done about 90% of the work, which might sound a bit strange, might sound um, a bit odd for me to say that, but in doing all of this preparation, you're gonna find it so much easier at the point of going live. And it doesn't need to be complex, it doesn't need to be difficult. What you can see that they've done here is they've just started talking about the fact that they've got this interesting project coming. For them, they're using the intrigue, they're using this hashtag, you are not your laundry, they're using really striking images that link back and use that, that wash club, um, or it's almost a logo, that branding that they have there. And they use that um, to, to start drumming up an audience and drumming up interest in what it is that they're doing. Starting those conversations so that at the point of going live, they have lots of people who already know that this is coming, they're already interested in it, and it's really just a case of them then converting them into being backers. So we've made it through step one, which is planning. We're now moving on to the more physical side, actually creating your project on the Crowdfunder website. Now it's really, really simple. If you haven't added a project yet, first thing I would say to do is literally get onto Crowdfunder and, and click that Start Crowdfunding button. Something to be really aware of is, you can, you can just play around this, but you can have fun. Everything that you put in there is changeable. We can edit it, we can delete it, you can, you can start all over again, it's absolutely fine. Best way just to figure out what it is you need to do is just have a go, okay? So, let's move through the four key elements that you'll have on your page and look at how we're going to um, put those together for you. So, first things first is, of course, your target. Now, setting a target is a little bit of a balance between figuring out how much money you need in order to make your project happen and how much money you think you can actually get from your crowd, what's realistic, looking back at that network map. Of course, we don't want you to set it so low in that actually you walk away thinking, I still can't achieve what it is I want to achieve. We would never want that to happen. But at the same time, we don't want it to be so huge 
that you that you don't end up reaching it and, and this has all you know been a bit of a wasted effort for you so it's really a case of, of doing some number crunching before going live now the average pledge on a crowdfunder for rewards is actually around about 50 pounds that does vary from project to project so if you think actually for me it might be a little bit lower because my rewards are a bit cheaper or it might be a little bit higher because my rewards are a bit more expensive then please do adjust um, you know, for yourselves. But using that number, you can actually start to think about target in terms of people instead of money, which I think is much more tangible and makes a lot more sense. So if you have a 5,000 pound target, and you know that on average, each person may pledge 50 pounds, you know really quickly that you need 100 people to pledge 50 pounds. You then look back at your network map that we drew earlier, and you sort of say to yourself, okay, where do I get those 100 people from? It makes it much easier to sort of figure out what it is you actually need to do to get there. And um, something I'll mention quickly um, on Crowdfunder is you do have two different ways of um, crowdfunding. You can go on all or nothing, which does exactly what it says on the tin. You have to reach your target. Otherwise, no money's taken from the backers. You don't receive anything. There's no fees, no rewards changed hands. Essentially, nothing happens, it, it, it didn't hit target. The other one is flexi funding, or keep what you raise. On that one, you still have a target, but no matter how much you raise, uh, even if it's, if it's below target, you still get the money. There's no difference in the fees between all or nothing or flexi, it's, it's the same fee, it's still 5%. And of course you can see a full list of our fees if you go onto the Crowdfunder website and search for fees. Because of course there, there are some um, costs associated with the different payment providers as well. Now people often ask, why do people go on one or the other? Why do they choose all or nothing or flexible funding? For the vast majority of projects, the best option is actually all or nothing. It's a much stronger motivator in your messaging when you're going out to the crowd in saying, we need this money to make this happen. It's, it's just not that potent, it's not that strong when it's keep what you raise, because they know that you know, no, no matter what you raise, you're still gonna keep the money. So you kind of lose that um, sense of urgency, that sense of need, um, and that drive in kind of reaching that target. Um, the kind of projects that, that are pretty good for flexible funding would be projects um, that are raising money for a charity, for example, whereby any, any amount of money um, you know, can be put to good use. Um, now, in terms of um, setting that target, also bear in mind your stretch target. Regardless of whether you're on all or nothing or flexible funding, you should still believe that your target is within reach. We don't want to set your target really high and then put yourself on flexible funding because it's just going to going to be really really hard to get that momentum and to really get things going when you're going to be on such small percentages right from the start. So bearing in mind that we want to hit that target, we think we can hit that target, we're confident, we should have ready a second target. So if we're originally going for 5000, we reach that within our allotted time. We can perhaps go for 7,000, perhaps 8,000. Now you can put that in when you're actually setting up your project. What happens, as soon as you hit 100%, as soon as you hit target, it automatically updates. It's very clever, it's, it's really, really useful, and it means that we're keeping your backers motivated, we're letting them know that there's more you can do with, that fund, with the funds raised, and you can actually keep updating the stretch target. You can put a new one in um, if, you, if you do reach that one as well, which of course you know, is a really great situation to be in. So for me, my favorite bit actually of setting up a project is writing the story. I, I quite enjoy writing um, and I really like making things look nice. <laughs> so this, this is really an opportunity for you to have a bit of fun with that. Um, we wanna make sure um, in your project description um, which is on, on second, the second tab when you're um, adding your project on Crowdfunder. We want to make sure that you are getting all of that key information in without waffling too much, without going into all the, the, the extra fluff and, and detail that people actually don't care about. Really focus on who you are, what you're trying to achieve, and why. What's that impact? Really, really key. Um, I find it quite useful to write down a load of bullet points, first of all, with all of the things that, that make my project interesting, that make them unique, um, that make it something that people would feel is worthwhile. Start with that, organize them into sections. 
organize them um, using those subheadings. Really, really important to use um, those formatting tools like subheadings, put things in bold, use bullet points to make it sure that it's really easy for people to digest. Big chunks of text are just not what people expect to, to come across online these days. So we've got to be very mindful of that. Definitely include some testimonials. Um, it's quite good to have other voices on the page other than just you going, I think my idea is great. You've got other people going, I also think this idea is great and this is why, or I'm involved with this and this is why I think it's wonderful. So getting those other voices on. You can of course have a section on rewards if you'd like, if you the specific ones you want to focus on. You can include images of, of your rewards and of course we want images um, of all the other things involved with your project as well. The word I like to use, or the term I like to use, is visual texture. We want to see real human beings, happy faces, smiley faces, um, people um, getting involved with whatever it is that you're doing. We want to see colour, we want it to be nice and bold. If you have a very local project, you know, make it feel local. Include photos of, of the town or of the location of wherever it is and really make sure that we're trying to get that personal connection in focusing down on, again, who you are, what you're trying to do and why. Really key to make sure that you've got a solid introduction right at the top of your page. For, for many people, if we don't sell them really quickly on why this what is worth them reading on, they're not going to do very much scrolling, they're not going to get further down. So make sure that punchy stuff is right at the top. The next opportunity that you have in, in telling your story and connecting with people is actually creating a video. Now, it's not mandatory, you don't have to do one, but I definitely advise it. Projects with videos perform so much better just because they're much easier for people to connect with. Other thing to bear in mind is when you've created that video, you then have that as this great, rich, engaging piece of content that you can share and you can use to get people interested in what you're doing. You can share that on social media, maybe you can post it um, you know, to, to people um, via an email. If you have a physical space, you can put it on the TV, you can show people what it is that you're all about. We definitely want to keep it short and sweet. Two minutes is really the maximum. If you want to do just a 10 second one, a 30 second one, that's fine. Get yourselves in front of the camera. Again, we want to see real human beings. Slideshows over a bit of music isn't really what we're looking for. We're looking for um, connecting with you, the artist, the project owner, the business owner, whoever that is, and understanding what you're all about. I personally find that over scripting it doesn't tend to work so well, unless you're very experienced um, in, in that kind of area. I think it's much better usually just to write down your key points figure out what it is that you need to make sure that you mention, and then just speak from the heart, ad lib, keep the camera rolling. If you have to you know, do 10 different goes of it, that's fine. Just pick the one that works best, the one that looks natural, and have some fun with it. We're not looking for a Spielberg production here. A lot of people just do it on their camera phone, and that's absolutely fine. Now here we have a little bit of an example of a video. Um, from a project. If you search for the Soapbox Theatre, you can actually watch it. I'm not going to play it now, because when I play it um, over one of these hangouts, it tends to go a bit funny and, and we get some weird feedback on, on the sound. But definitely um, do watch that um, and have a look through at some other arts projects and have a look at what they've done with their videos too. Okay, so rewards. This is where, um, as artists, I think you can, again, have quite a bit of fun with this. Um, the kind of things that you might want to include as rewards, let's whip through some examples. Organising an exhibition. It doesn't need to be a black tie affair, although it certainly can be if you'd like it to be. You can even just um, put up some photos in, in a local community space, in a church, a library, in your own home even. Or in the summer, why not get some... Um, some, some easels outside and do something um, around your garden or around a local park, you know, something um, really, really fun like that. It's a great way to actually meet the people that have contributed towards your project if you're not already um, familiar with them. And it's a really great way to actually just raise awareness of what it is that you're doing um, anyway, and again, raising your profile. Um, an artist masterclass is a really, really good one, and it's actually one that you can specifically think, oh, I know some people that would be really interested in that. 
So again, looking back at your network map, you can look at um, perhaps people in, 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 a, in a local school or college or university who are perhaps um, you know, up and coming and budding artists themselves. Is there a technique that you can show them or, or something that's going to be really of value to them, whether that's an hour or a half day? Um, you know, are, you, are you a photographer? Can you take people to some of your local spots and, and teach them about something specific? Um, if you're a sculptor, perhaps there's something that you could show them, a different way of working. I'm sure de depending on what it is that you're, um, that you're doing, there's lots again that you can do there. Um, obviously physical things work really, really well, but do bear in mind that you're going to have to get these to people. Um, if you're getting things printed off, you need to think about postage as well. Original artwork is a really fantastic one, whether you want to do that really small scale, just a, a little sketch, a little limerick or something that you can do for people, or whether you want to do you know, a proper commission, um, something which is going to be a bit of a chunkier piece of work. Prints, really fantastic. Always think about what people are going to use those prints for. Is it something that's going to go on the wall that looks fantastic? If so, we need to make sure that we're providing them with an idea or, or, or a, a, an example as to what it is that they're buying into. People aren't going to pledge on a print without having any, any idea what that is. Um, perhaps you're getting your um, art done up onto things like a tote bag or on a, on a tea towel even. Depending on what it is that you're doing, um, of course, there's a, a lot of kind of physical things that you can do with that. But again, do bear in mind those costs. Thank yous. It sounds like the most obvious one, but it's actually a really, really um, key group to think about for rewards. Actually, the, the feedback that we get from a lot of people who back projects is that their motivation is not only getting that reward, but it's also just that they think it's a good idea. They want to support you know, this project, support this person and what it is that they're doing. So whether that's a letter of thanks, whether that's naming something after that person or that organization, having a plaque done, having a thank you um, space on, on your website or whatever that might be. I've even known a, a project locally, the Wave Project, where actually everyone who backed their crowdfunder project got their name on their van. Um, and now I still see that driving around um, Nuki from time to time. And you can still spot um, everyone's names written down the side of the van. So we've made it this far. We have our project together. I'll just give you a minute to, to kind of take stock and, and check that you're up to date with where you want to be. And while I have a little sip of water. So the final step is actually running the project. Of course, first thing we have to do is launch it, get off to a great start, make sure we're keeping people up to date and share, share, share. So in terms of launching your project, as soon as possible, I would get a date in the diary. It puts a little bit of pressure on yourself, gives you something to work to, and gets you thinking about when, you're, when we're doing those, those warm-ups and growing your crowd, you have that date to work to, you have something to tell people about. When you're telling people about the fact this is coming, you can tell them when it's coming. Now, generally speaking, we find that um, midweek, in, in the evenings, or, or sort of late afternoon, tends to be good times to launch. And um, of course, if, if there's another day or another day or time which you think is specifically really good for your audience, then do, of course, adjust that. Be aware of other things that are going on um, in the calendar. Obviously, we have Bonfire Night just around the corner and Halloween before then. If your project somehow ties in with something else that's going on locally, whether that's an event or, or something like a, a public holiday, definitely keep that in mind. How can you use that? How can you jump on that? If you know that actually there's a big community event um, that's happening you know, this weekend, can you make sure that you attend and that you're able to somehow tell everyone who's at that event about your project? So getting off to a great start, really, really key. We're gonna go back to Wash Club, um, the example we were looking at earlier, and see exactly what happened when they launched. So you can see on that first day, they got a really nice chunk of money in. We really want to be hitting at least 10% in that first 24 hours. Easiest way to do that is to line it up. Take the guesswork away. Have those conversations with them. your inner network, with those people closest to you before going live and make sure you've got at least 10% sort of promised that you know is going to be pledged you know, immediately. Really good place to start is the Christmas card list. Um, it's actually my birthday this week, so what I would do is check through everyone who sent me a birthday card, 
all of those people would be the people I'd be going out to first of all. But the people closest to me, most likely to support the project. Okay. So going on from there, we really want to be hitting 30% in the first sort of three to four days, just to prove that we're serious and, and to give us a bit of momentum and get things going. Now, this is a really common um, view of, of how those pledges come in. Well, we have a peak at the start, we have a little bit of a flat bit in the middle, and then it really flies towards the end. This is, this is what we see on a lot of projects. It's worth me mentioning, actually, at this stage, that you'll have access to this graph, this data, and lots of other really useful data on who's visiting your page, what they're pledging, what, what that's bringing into you in terms of money, and you can see all of that on your live dashboard once your project is live on Crowdfunder. So you can actually see all of this, and you can download it. Um, as an Excel spreadsheet so you can sort of work through if that's what you'd like to do. Um, of course, we want to make sure that we've got lots of things planned in our calendar to keep things rolling. You can almost see, you can almost imagine when they've had, you know, a big email go out or they've attended an event because you see it jump up. Essentially, the, the more you do, the more pledges you'll get. And the key analogy for getting things out of the starting gates is to start from the middle and work your way out just as I was talking about a moment ago. Start with those people closest to you and slowly work your way to the outside. The reason being, when your project is really new, it hasn't quite got that social proof, hasn't quite got that credibility of being attractive to those people who have no idea who you are, what you're all about. You really need to, to, to kind of prove it first. Prove it by getting people that you know to pledge before you can expect strangers to. If you can't get people you know to support the project, it's very unlikely that people who have no idea who you are are gonna come on and support you. You just don't have that credibility. You just don't have that social proof yet. Let's have a look at what Wash Club did, again, um, on their updates. So this is something that you can do, again, once your project is live on Crowdfunder. If you logged in, you head to your project page, you'll see there's a tab there, Updates. What it does when you click on there is opens up, it's, it's a little text box, like it looks like a, a perhaps if you were creating an email. So you have a subject line and then you have a, a box where you can put in images, you can put in words. And what that does is that actually gets emailed out directly to everyone who's backed your project so far. But it also appears publicly on that updates tab on your project page. So it's a really good way of showing people that there's things happening, that it's exciting, that there's things bubbling away, things are changing, things are moving forwards, which is all of the things that we want to show. But also in keeping your backers close, making them feel important, making them feel valued, and that actually they're a part of this. It's really, really key that, and that they're actually joining you in making this happen. So we want to, them to be the first people to know about any exciting news, and we can also use these updates to convert those backers into advocates to actually get them spreading the word too, to get them working as channels of communication and reaching out to their own networks. So share, share, share is obviously that last point. Now, we could go on forever about all the different ways of you getting your project out there. Um, social media is a really, really key one. Um, normally around about 30 to 40% of pledges on, on a project by, on, on Crowdfunder come from Facebook. For Twitter, it's actually usually a bit lower, around about 10%, but it's actually still very good at awareness, at engagement, it's very short and sharp. But we definitely want to make sure that you're using these two really key tools in um, pushing your project out. The other one which is really key actually is email. Again, around about 30 to 40% of pledges coming from email. So in that lead up time to you going live, have a look at your email database, have a look at your contact list and check that you've got a good number of people there and that they're, um, it's relevant, it's up to date, um, that it's, it's, a good, it's a good list for you to use. Um, I would always go with the most direct and the most personal form of communication first. So ideally, that's things like picking up the phone. It might be sending a text. It might be then an email. It might be WhatsApp, maybe a Snapchat. Maybe then you put something and, and you, you tag people in it on Facebook. 
Maybe you send a direct message on Facebook. Maybe you even set up an event on Facebook and invite everyone you know to it. There's so many different things you can do online, but don't also forget the offline stuff. Your project is also taking place in the real world. So going out to people in your local community, whether that's getting some posts up, getting some flyers out, attending an event, um, whatever that might be, is all good stuff that will play into um, driving that awareness, driving that interest, and therefore actually getting people to pledge on your project. So we're just going to run through a couple of examples now of um, some past projects. This one, um, I believe, actually might even still be live, or it might have only just closed. Um, really fantastic project, raised a really huge amount of money um, with over 150 backers. So definitely check that one out. Have a look at their project page for a good example. This one is, is an example of how actually you don't need to be raising lots and lots of money in order to crowdfund. Actually, if you only just need a, a little handful of money, that's fine as well. It's a really good way of getting visibility of what you're doing still and of, of doing all of those other things that we spoke about in terms of raising awareness. So you don't have to be trying to raise 12,000 or you know, a, a number as big as that in order to, to crowdfund fantastic one that I worked with um, I think it was a couple of years ago now of a really wonderful artist who um, actually has kind of access all areas at V Festival and does some fantastic pieces of art that he actually does um, while the, um, the musicians are live and on stage and this was a, again a really great one for you to have a look at um, as a bit of an example Okay, so what we're going to do now is quickly talk about the funding that we have which is available for artists. Now, a few things about this fund, it's available for individual artists, um, so if you're an organisation or uh, a business, it might not necessarily be the right one for you, but this is for individual artists. Um, we're looking um, for projects that are forwarding um, or sort of furthering your artistic skill. It's giving you an opportunity to do something different. We're looking for any, any sort of project essentially, which you as an individual artist um, is, is helping you to, to develop. That's I, I think probably the, the easiest way of explaining it. Um, best thing to do is head to the crowdfunder site again, forward slash artists. You can click through from there and actually see the full criteria and see what it is, um, the, the boxes that you need to tick essentially to be eligible for this fund. You need to be running a project on Crowdfunder. That's really, really key. And your project target needs to be between £4,000 and £40,000. The funding that you may get, that you may receive by, by filling out an application and, and starting crowdfunding, it can be up to 25% of your target. And you need to hit at least 25% in order for your project to be eligible for that pledge. You actually receive that pledge straight, straight onto Crowdfunder, straight onto your, on, onto your project there, and that will go um, towards the, the money that you need for your target. So if, for example, you were raising £4,000, you first need to raise 1000 You might then get a pledge of 1000 you then have to raise the final 2000 in order to um, receive that money. Also worth me noting that in order to be eligible for this funding, your project does need to be on all or nothing. So all or nothing between 4000 and 40000 But please do check um, the forward slash artists page to see that full criteria. Essentially, it, it's a really great fund which is available for a really um, broad scope of, of different artists. So definitely, definitely have a look at that. And actually, if you know anyone else who you think, um, you know, off the top of your head or any projects locally, where you think actually this might be something that's really great for them, I think it's a fantastic opportunity. So please do spread the word. Okay, so that's got us to pretty much where I wanted to be um, today. Here we are, I'm back. So hopefully um, some of you found that useful. Um, obviously, we're, it's a bit, bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, trying to get through everything um, very, very quickly. Um, if you have any questions, anything that's come up as we've been going through this, please do um, send them in to me via Twitter, is the best way. Uh, you can find me at Sammy Morger, which is spelt 
S-A-M-I M-A-U-G-E-R at Sammy Morger. If you head to um, the crowdfunder account, you can see that um, I've been tagged in a post, uh, I think this morning on there, so you can find me really easily. Any feedback, any questions, please do get in touch. Uh, more than happy to help. Um, and hopefully, I'll